Days 701 to 704. Night melted into day and then night again. Food was thrown at me in my cell, a rough stone and wood construction barely big enough to let me stand upright. Spent most of my time slumped on the ground, head in a daze. Along with the food came fistfuls of some sort of powder, clearly a powerful mind-affecting agent hurled at me in my cage. Despite my best efforts, I had no choice but to breathe it deep. After the second dose, I didn't even resist anymore. I ate, I waited, I breathed it in deep. Mind spinning and reeling, vision distorted, turning the gawking faces outside my cage into horrible caricatures of humans. Then darkness came. A splash of ice-cold water woke me. My mind was still reeling, but a little bit clearer now. Rough hands dragged me out of my cage and threw me onto a hard dirt floor. The sun was blinding, but soon numerous faces loomed over me, blocking out its light. Well, El Gringo didn't die. This one's tough, maybe he can fight. Look at those scars. This Gringo fights all right. Then there was a different voice, one with authority. My eyes searched for the source, but I still couldn't move my head or crane my neck to change my point of view. Let the Gringo sober up, then give him El Fuego. Tomorrow he fights. There was a crass indifference in the voice, and suddenly a new figure loomed over me. This one was tall, and unlike the faces around me which seemed adorned with various Aztec or tribal tattoos, face paint, and piercings, he looked relatively modern in a white suit and fedora. He leaned heavily on a cane as he looked down at me. If he can't fight, he dies. With a nod from him, hands grasped me, hauled me upright, and soon I was back in my cage. Days 705 to 708. I woke to cold water again. This time, my mind was clearer, but I could still feel a fog lurking somewhere deep inside. Once more, my cage was opened and I was dragged out into the morning sun. This time, my eyes adjusted rapidly. I was in a small holding area of some kind, surrounded by other cells like mine. Some were empty, others not. Some, I suspected, were just corpses now waiting to be removed. Strong hands gripped my arms and kept them pinned behind my back as I struggled to break free. Then an old man, looking like something straight out of an Aztec wall mural, started poking and prodding me. His old gnarled fingers pinched my muscles, opened my eyes, and craned my head down so we could look at him. Gringo is good, healthy, ready for fuego. I felt ropes being tied around my arms, trapping them behind my back, and then I was forced into a metal collar connected to a long pole, like something a dog catcher might use to move a dangerous canine. I grunted and fought, my strength returning to me, but no avail. Then suddenly the old man was before me again his hand flinging a red powder directly at my face. Despite my best efforts, I breathed it in. Fire exploded in my throat and lungs, like eating a bunch of raw chilies and swallowing them down quickly. Then, a different fire lit up, this time in my brain. My vision went slightly cloudy and red tinged at the edges. I roared and flexed my arms, the ropes creaking a bit under the strain. The large Azteco holding my restraining device looked concerned for a second. I was push-dragged forward by the neck and into a small stone room. Then, pressing a button on the restraining device, my neck collar opened and the Azteco hurried out while a door was hastily shut behind him. I panted in pure rage, my body breaking out in a furious sweat. On the opposite side of the small stone room was a gate of some kind, built out of heavy wood. I could hear a rhythmic pounding on the other side, and I threw myself at the gate in anger. I could see in between kinks in the wood daylight on the other side. Then suddenly the gate was pulled upward and I tumbled out into the bright daylight outside. Immediately the roar of a crowd greeted me and I roared back like a feral creature. The noise of it all blended together, my mind reduced to a primal state and making no sense of the words they said or chanted. On the opposite side of a small sandy area a larger fancier gate made of iron was pulled up by a system of pulleys. Calmly strolling out of it was a tall, well-muscled Azteco man. He wore a traditional head garb and his face was painted in color to look like a jaguar. He wielded a large, flat obsidian blade in one hand and an animal hide shield in the other. He strolled out to greet the crowd, which exploded in renewed cheers as he bowed and put on a short display. I was completely unarmed, but that didn't matter. My drug-fueled brain was fueled by pure rage and adrenaline, and my body acted without thinking as I threw myself into a sprint straight at my opponent. To his credit, he quickly recovered from the shock of my sudden charge, then grinning settled into an easy fighting stance blade held behind him and ready for either a thrust or a swing. My body was moving on its own, but my brain was still working, more efficiently than it had ever before. Cutting through the rage was strategy and plan. I'd seen this fighting style before from the Aztecos who attacked the Army of the Dawn. My brain told my body what was coming next, and my body responded in a combination of plan and instinct, combining my new knowledge with years of physical training and US Army hand-to-hand -hand combat. He swung his shield in front of him and thrust straight forward with the obsidian blade. With my right arm, I deflected the thrust upward, 
causing the blade to slice my cheek open as the momentum carried me forward. Then, with my left arm, I delivered a bone-crunching punch straight into his exposed flank. From his short scream and the way his body contorted, I knew he'd either ruptured or bruised a kidney. With my momentum still carrying me past him, I was now behind him and I quickly wrapped my arms around his neck from behind, putting him into a chokehold. But my rage-powered mind forced my body to jerk upward and back rapidly, howling in fury as I lifted him off his feet, with a sudden twist accompanied by the pop of several vertebrae being pulled out of position. His neck ragdolled forward as I dropped his body. The crowd was silent for a moment, then burst out in screams and howls. Half were cheering for me, the other half screaming for my blood. I soaked it all in, the chaos and noise feeding the rage. The fuego made me strong, stronger and faster than I would normally be, and it made the killing easy. Days 709 to 711. The effect of the fuego lasted all day. I got moved to a different cage, this one larger and more comfortable with straw bedding. The man with the authoritative voice came to see me at some point. Time was still difficult to track with my drug-addled mind. See, you fight for me, you do good, you live good, keep fighting, keep doing good, you live better. He was dressed in his same spotless white suit and fedora, leaning on a walking stick with a large, clear crystal set at the pommel. You fight good, you make money. I make money, I reward you. Good food, women, men, whatever you like. I couldn't focus on his words, instead my hands ached to wrap themselves around his throat. He seemed to notice and took a half step back away from the bars of the cage. You make a lot of people angry killing the jaguar, but angry people means bigger crowd, more money for me. Here, token of my appreciation. He nodded to one of his men who tossed me a large piece of unidentified meat. The primeval brain pounced on it. It was well roasted and delicious. Days 712 to 716. I fought again. I must have won because I fought again two days later. I don't remember much, the drugs made my memory hazy. The first drug, the white powder, I got less and less often now. The red one I'd get the day of the fight. They called it fuego, and with good reason, it was like having hot coal shoved into your belly and brain, turning you into a beast. I understood now how hordes of screaming Aztecos armed with axes and clubs could face an entire company of riflemen with little regard for their lives. I must have been doing a good job in the arena because I was still alive. When I'd come down off the fuego, I'd find new wounds on my body which were expertly stitched up. Say what you will about being a Thunderdome slave, at least the healthcare was free and top-notch. Days 717 to 720. I got moved to an even larger cage, one with separate cubbies, the equivalent of having your own private space. It wasn't much, but afforded a tiny bit of privacy, another reward. There were three other fighters in there, one that looked like he'd been through a shredder, his body was covered in scars and he had fresh cuts from a recent fight. He was also missing one of his eyes. The other was short, head wrapped with a large bloody bandage. He didn't last long. Hours after my arrival, he was dragged away. Sold for meat, said my third cellmate. That's what they do when you can't fight anymore. Take too bad a wound and not even good enough for entertaining slaughter fodder. You go off to the meat market, like El Ganado. He was a mountain of a man, dark skinned with thick Vato accent. He'd grown up north of the border, that was immediately obvious, but his tattoos made it clear he was, or had been, a cartel member, one of the cartels that got swallowed up by the bigger cartels after the world ended. POWs killed, enslaved, or in his case, sold, to fight or be meat. You can call me Vaccaro. I've seen you fight. You fight like a madman. That's why I speak to you. If you couldn't fight, I wouldn't care. Only the strong matter here, comprendes? I nodded my head, still thick with fog from the drugs. Drugs still got you all messed up in the head, eh, say? Don't worry, you get less of it now. White stuff is to make you ready for the fuego. Not everyone survives it, but you did. And you're here, so you're strong. That's good. If you're not strong, you die. El fuego? What is it? I could barely croak out the words. I felt like my tongue was swollen in my mouth after nearly a three-week bender. Who knows, S.A.? Make you fight good, though. Aztecos take it, they fight good. Some tribal crap from the deep jungles. You're not Azteco? Hell nah, homie, they jumped me and my crew. We were running around after it all went down, you know, just grabbing what we could, selling idiotas to the markets, wandering around with no protection. We were surviving, then a group of them found us. The rest didn't make it. Here I am, though. Vaccaro didn't die easy, Holmes. Not in the old world. Not in this crazy, messed up, upside down one. I could see the bullet wound scars on his chest from his old life, alongside new scars obviously gotten in this new one. Seems one life naturally evolved into the next, until the Aztecos found him. I was stuck a gladiator slave, and my new best friend was a raider. Days 721 to 725. Vaccaro ducked under the massive piece of chain threatening to take his head clean off. For such a big man, he was surprisingly fast. 
He got inside the other gladiator's swing and grabbed him by the shirt before delivering a bone-crunching headbutt to his nose. The heavy chain dropped from his limp hand as the gladiator briefly blacked out from the impact. I took the opportunity to rush up and snatch it, entangling the man's legs with it. Vaccaro and the gladiator were about evenly matched physically and I felt the impact of both of them hitting the ground. Then Vaccaro sort of stood up looking a bit confused. The gladiator had fallen straight onto a rock, hitting his head on it. He was dead before he even realized it. The crowd couldn't see that though, all they saw was victory and they erupted in cheers. The fuego was still coursing through my veins, but I'd started to learn to control it a little bit. I had just a bit more clarity than normal. That's how I spotted Clay and Annie in the stands, both looking down at me horrified. Days 726 to 734. We fought until it was only Vaquero and I left in the main cage. The fuego turned us into animals, but it took a day or two to recover. Then we were thrown back into the arena, our veins pulsing with liquid fire and our teeth gnashing for the taste of the ultraviolence and the blood. Days 735 to 739. You've been quiet, Vato. Que pasa? I'd hardly touched my food, and without asking, Vaquero helped himself to it. We were getting prime cuts of meat now, even fresh fruit. Our rewards for our many victories, all making our owner, the man we called El Señor, richer. He'd even offered us women or men, whatever we preferred. Vaquero had taken both. I declined. Seeing Annie's face had pushed aside some of the drug's effects and brought reality back to the forefront. What are we going to do, Vak? Fight here till we die? I got people out there that need me. The drugs, they made me forget. Vaquero signed as he played with half an orange that I'd left untouched. Claro que no. Listen, I've been waiting this whole time for a partner like you. We can escape, but it's not a one-man job. You mean you like me because I can fight? Vaquero laughed. Yeah, sure, Vato, but no, I mean smaller than me. Like you, you can fit. I cocked my eyebrow. Fit where? He had my attention. Looking past the gates of our holding pen to make sure the coast was clear, he motioned for me to follow him to his small cubicle-like private area. After one last check over his shoulder, he moved his blanket and bedding aside to show me a section of the iron bars he'd worked loose. See, I'm too big to squeeze through, and if I work on more of these, it's going to give me away, but if I move one more bar out of the way, you can go through. I was impressed. I'd seen Vaquero deliver some annihilating blows in the arena, but the strength it must have taken to bend these bars loose was immense. Eyeballing the opening he had created, I nodded my head in agreement. I have friends on the outside looking for me. If I can contact them, they can help. Good. Listen, next match we win, you say you want a girl. Then, when others leave, I know a guard. You give him the girl, and he'll bring your friends for a visit. Just don't say nothing stupid about escape in front of him. I nodded again. All we had to do was win one more time. I was pretty sure Annie would be at the next match again. Days 740 to 745. In Roman times, gladiator deaths were extremely uncommon. There was no profit in having slaves trained and fed for months or even years for them to just simply die. But in the Azteco lands, gladiators were expected to die. There was no mercy given, not even to the wounded. If you couldn't fight and survive the match, you went to the meat market. The fuego hit me like it always did, but I'd held my breath this time, only ingesting part of the drug. I needed some clarity if our plan was going to be a success. He did the same. The drug gave you a hell of a hangover, which explained why gladiators were so fearsome in the arena, but compliant in their pens. The drug made you photosensitive, which explains why the Aztecos preferred to fight at night. My eyes struggled to adjust as the gate opened and we stepped out onto the sandy floor. Vaquero and I fought as a duo now, and we made a lot of teams upset by killing their best gladiators. The crowd loved their heroes, but the thrill of seeing a hero fall in a shower of their own blood was even better. They were getting bored of us. They wanted to see us die. The opposing gate opened and out walked four men. As my eyes slowly adjusted to the light, a stunning realization hit me, even through the rage-inducing haze of the fuego in my veins. Twenty-five yards across from me, holding a makeshift spear and looking as if he'd been surviving in the arena for a few weeks himself, was Robert, my mentor from my time with the Army of the Dawn. If I had received a full dose, I doubted I would have recognized him. An announcer signaled the customary start to the battle and the crowd immediately roared with anticipation and excitement. The four men charged at a fast trot. I recognized the drug-induced stupor they were in, and I knew that calling out to Robert would be pointless. Even if he heard me over the thundering crowd, he'd never recognize me with the fuego burning in his brain. Vaquero and I fought back to back, the same style we'd used many matches before, but this was the first time we were trying to fend off twice our number. Another fighter thrusted with his spear and I deflected it with a small buckler I wore on my left arm, making sure to knock the spear point high so it wouldn't stab Vaquero behind me. Then I immediately spun and stepped into the attacker to finish him off with a large knife. Behind me, Vaquero was wielding a large sledgehammer that had become his signature weapon. It required a lot of room to swing, which meant I had to be careful and not stand too close behind him. 
but any attempt to block a blow from that hammer would mean a crushed shield and a shattered arm. He wielded the heavy weapon with surprising deftness, swinging over the head of one attacker and burying it in the chest of the man next to him. Bones splintered and crunched, and the man coughed up blood. It was a death blow, and Vaccaro ignored him as the man dropped to his knees, focusing on the first attacker. Fire exploded across my back and ribs as I barely managed to shimmy away from my own second gladiator's attack. My brain had responded in instinct to the incoming blow, and only now I realized it was Robert. He was wielding a two-handed cesty with jagged wooden spikes coming out of the knuckles. One was covered in my blood. Robert, I called out to him, hoping he'd hear me at close range. If he did, he didn't acknowledge. His eyes showed no recognition. Robert, it's me! I tried again, but I knew it was pointless. The fuego had him. His mind, body, and soul craved, no, needed violence. He roared and threw himself at me as I barely managed to jump out of the way in time. I could feel the rage inside me growing. The fuego I did consume was making rationality difficult. Damn this fool, why was he here? How did he get caught? Why wasn't he listening? I wanted to tear off his head for being so stupid, for making me fight him. I roared my own challenge and lashed out at him with my knife. He blocked it with a cestus and managed to get my blade entangled in his wooden claws, twisting sharply and making me drop the blade. I didn't hesitate though and lashed out with my metal buckler, catching him on the side of the head. At the same time though, he thrust out with his other cestus and raked my ribs, narrowly avoiding impaling several of the wooden claws deep in my chest cavity. The blow to the head dazed him though and he stumbled backwards. I growled like a leopard and threw myself at him, tackling him to the ground. My hands wrapped around his throat as he tried to bite at me, his teeth snapping like some feral animal. Then the fog faded slightly, the weakened effect of the fuego not powerful enough to fully turn me into a murderous madman. Robert had not just shown me how to survive in the Army of the Dawn, he'd become something close to a friend. He was a genuinely good man caught up in a bad world, forced to fight for a dictator in order to keep his family safe. I'd thought him a coward at first, but the more he told me about them, the more I saw the love in his eyes. The more I understood. Understood because I too had done terrible things to keep my family safe. Cutting through the fuego like a searing blade came their faces. Annie, Lily, Robbie, Meg, Lucky, and Alexis. Robert roared with a mighty throw and pushed me off him, sending me tumbling. He sprang to his feet and recovered one of his cestuses, crouched like a jungle cat before leaping forward, sharp wooden claws aimed straight at my heart. Then came a dull, sickening crunch as Vaquero's sledgehammer buried itself on top of his skull ending his leap through the air prematurely as he ragdolled to the floor. I was panting, nearly out of breath, a terrible feeling welling up in the deepest part of my stomach. The fuego was nearly out of my system. I'd been sobered up in seconds. The crowd exploded into roars of approval or outrage. Vaccaro laughed and hoisted me up, pumping his fist in the air as he returned the crowd's shouts and screams. There in the faces of the crowd, I saw Annie and Clay next to her again. We locked eyes for a moment, long enough for me to mouth the word, wait. Days 746 to 749. The guard we bribed with my reward was true to his word, and the next night he brought Annie and Clay over. Annie's face was normally set in stone, but her mask slipped for just a moment as she locked eyes with me for a second in my cage. Pity, compassion, anger, but also revulsion? She had watched me in several fights now. She held my hand as we talked in hushed whispers through the bars, though I couldn't help but notice her hesitation. You look… are you okay? Yeah, they give us this drug. Makes us… never mind. No time to explain. I told Annie about the loose bars. Her and Clay nodded solemnly as I explained our plan and the part they'd have to play. I didn't know if I could really count on Clay, but I guess the fact that he had stuck around this long counted for something. Then again, I doubt Annie would have let him leave me behind. Hey man, as soon as we realized you were alive, there was no way I was leaving with you in that arena. It was as if he'd read my mind. I looked at Clay's face, searching it. I found honesty there. I'd only recently got to know him. He was a representative from the group of veterans whose weapons and supplies Farmbridge and the allied communities desperately needed to remain independent from the Iron Lady or fight off the Aztecos. You should have left me, both of you. Getting word back to your people was more important than me. Annie shook her head. Just shut up, okay? We sent a messenger. Even here, people can be reliable for the right price. I noticed then that Annie was missing her favorite rifle. I don't think I'd ever seen her sleep without it at her side. The guard was coming back, telling us in a loud whisper that we had to wrap it up. Annie squeezed my hand tightly. There was just a series of looks again. Pity, compassion, anger, and revulsion. Stay alive, okay? Just a few more days. We'll be waiting. Days 750 to 754. We were waiting for the new moon, when the night would be darkest. Until then, Vaccaro and I had to fight one more time. 
I fully inhaled the fuego. Truth was, it made it easier to do what we had to do in the arena, and I was terrified of finding another familiar face. Maybe this time it would be Clay's or Annie's. Or I held onto Alexis's face in my mind as long as I could, until the fuego hit my veins and ripped it away from me, replacing it all with a red-hot fury. Days 755 to 758. Fights were temporarily suspended when the weather got bad enough that nobody would come out to watch them. The rain that fell was ice cold and irradiated. Nobody wanted to expose themselves more than they had to. Vicaro and I sheltered in the driest corner of our cell, staying away from the poison rainfall. It was lucky rain, though. The arena was more determined than ever to kill us, too. We'd overstayed our welcome as arena champions. The crowd was getting bored. Another fight or two and the odds would finally be too great for us. We both bore the scars of our battles, despite getting surprisingly good medical treatment. As long as we were profitable, we were worth the investment. Day 759 to 763. The Aztecos celebrated the various phases of the moon, but they were superstitious about the new moon. They tended to stay shut up indoors during the new moon, not staying out late if they could help it. This made it the perfect night for our escape. I shimmied through the bars Vaquero had loosened. There were two guards in the small hut where the keys to the cells were kept. But after doing their nightly check of all the cages and cells, they typically would either doze off or play cards to kill time. It was harder work not being detected by the other slaves and gladiators than it was to sneak up on those two. I could have probably reached in through the small window and grabbed the keys without them realizing it, but that wasn't the plan. They had to die so the rest of the plan would work. Once I had the keys, I rushed back to our cage and unlocked it, letting Vaquero out. Now the time for being quiet was over, I moved to the cage next to ours and undid their lock waking the gladiators up from their sleep and telling them they were free. I did the same for the rest of the cells and cages, letting loose a few dozen former slaves. Most of them wanted revenge, and they armed themselves with whatever they could grab, making their way to El Senor's home. I could already hear the shout of the guards and the screaming by the time Vicaro and I left the compound to meet up with Annie and Clay. They had clothes waiting for us, and Clay had a pair of pliers that he could use to work the metal-studded collars marking us as slaves loose. The town was slowly coming to life as people rushed out to see what the commotion was all about, then called for the guards. There'd be a slaughter, with a small army of over three dozen former gladiators let loose, both sides killing each other. Our small group stuck to the shadows and back alleys acting like fleeing civilians. But before we made it across to the safety of the wilderness on the other side of town, I stopped. I hated this place. I hated the Aztecos and everything they stood for. The Iron Lady was brutal, but she brought order out of the chaos. The Aztecos were the chaos. I grabbed a large iron brazier and dragged it over next to a house. Vato, what you doing? Let's go! I ignored the group and kept dragging the huge brazier, finally knocking it over and spilling red-hot coals onto the side of one of the wood and plaster homes. The home went up in a flash. Within a minute, the fire was already spreading to the next home. This entire town would burn. I watched the blaze for a few more moments before letting Vaquero drag me away. Days 764 to 769. If anyone was pursuing us, we didn't notice, but we still moved cautiously, trying to travel mostly at night. More inclement weather rolled in and we were forced to take shelter from a rainstorm for a few days. With luck, though, we'd soon be on the other side of the Gulf of California. I'd only hoped the boat we hidden over two months ago was still there and in good condition. Days 770 to 774. Some of the gladiators we liberated must have been captured, and they must have said who set them free. No doubt after thorough torture or at least the threat of it. Small groups of Aztecos were prowling the roads. On our way, we'd spotted one or two at most. Vaquero and I had made a name for ourselves in the local region, though, and there were probably few locals who hadn't shown up to see us fight. We had to evade as best we could. We only had one rifle and two handguns between the four of us. I ached to grab an Azteco by the throat with my bare hands, though, a surprising, if brief, lust for violence erupting whenever we spotted one of their warbands. I chalked it up to the after-effects of months of being forced to ingest the Fuego drug. We finally made it to the boat, and were surprised to find it in good shape, still tied up to the small cove we hidden it in. With Vaquero's huge mass, though, I felt certain the tiny boat would flip, but with some careful navigation we managed to cross the Gulf of California, landing not too far from the small village that had hosted us before we crossed our way into the Azteco Hell. Days 775 to 779. The village had been razed to the ground. There were still bones and unidentified remains with bits of cloth the scavengers hadn't yet eaten. Annie, Clay, and I stared in horror. Vicaro seemed unfazed. Of course, he hadn't known these people, experienced their kindness, and then sentenced them to death thinking we were doing the right thing by protecting them from bandits. This was outside of any organized territory, and a local gang had put this village under their thumb. When they couldn't pay what the bandits wanted in taxes, they'd taken two of the young girls for themselves. That's when I stepped out of my hiding place, shooting the men dead. 
I could still hear the old woman's mournful warning in my ears. The rest of the gang would be back. We'd sentence them to death. I guess they thought they'd run away or I don't know. We made camp inside one of the mostly intact abodes. Annie and I sat outside watching the stars. I'm tired, Annie. She was silent a few moments before speaking. I know. Remember Mr. Vasquez? She seemed surprised for a moment. I didn't blame her. That was an entire lifetime ago. I promised him we'd go back and properly bury his wife. Annie was silent. Instead of words, she reached out and grabbed my hand, giving it a firm squeeze. I'm glad neither of them lived to see all this. Somewhere far to the east, where we'd just come from, there was lightning flashing. I held my gaze on it and Annie kept her silence. Days 780 to 785. Maybe now that we were out of Azteco territory, none of us feared running into whoever was roaming the northwest Mexican wastes. Maybe we were all eager to finally get back to friendly faces. Whatever the reason, we made record time, pushing ourselves as hard as we could. The old US-Mexico border was only a few miles away now. We made camp again before crossing. Annie and Clay dozed while Vaquero and I stood watch. A strange bond had developed between us. I wouldn't say friendship, but a kinship of sorts. But would that last outside the life and death threat of the arena? What are you going to do when we get north? Vaquero seemed to think for a moment, gazing out at the nighttime desert. Do what I can with the time I got, I guess. Rob, a raid, steal, whatever I gotta do to live best until I bite it. Farmbridge and other communities, they're not really like that. They have order and… yeah, yeah, order and rules and laws, I know, Vato. Like the old world, right? That ain't no place for me. What am I gonna do, start farming? There's a place for you. You're good in a fight. We need people like that. You know what's out there better than most. Yeah, I do, Vato. That's why I'm getting the hell away from it. I'll go north, find somewhere outside your farm place or whatever. Do my thing. I didn't doubt he would. And I didn't doubt he'd be good at it either. That's what worried me. And you, I say, what you gonna do with your little time you got left? You must have seen the surprise on my face. Why, don't tell me you don't know. Know what? The fuego, Vato. You use it enough, it gets in you, in your brain. Rots it up from the inside. You know how you turn into a monster when you get high? I nodded. It's like that, but all the time. They call them zombies, you know, like in the movie. I didn't answer. I couldn't answer. I'd felt the lingering effects of the fuego, wishing I could just wrap my hands around every Azteco patrol we'd seen while hiding, but I thought it was just aftershocks, my body detoxing from the drug. Months, years, who knows? But everybody that gets dosed like we got dosed turns zombie, they say. Everybody. Why do you think Azteco's so fucking crazy at war? Vaquero laughed and tapped the side of his head. You're ticking time bomb now, Vato. I nodded slowly. My thoughts turned to Farmbridge, then Christina. No, past her to Alexis, Annie, Lily, Robbie, Meg, Lucky, my family. Then I thought about Vaquero. He'd go north, he said, do what he did best, and I knew he'd be good at it. And when he fell to the fuego, who knows what horrors he'd unleash. He never even heard the gunshot that sent a 45 caliber slug through the back of his brainstem and out the front of his throat. He never felt a moment of pain. He just fell over on his side, instantly dead, the same knowing smile still frozen on his lips. Annie and Clay rushed out of their sleeping bags, both reaching for their weapons. I knew him in the arena. He had no place amongst us. He was a monster, through and through. Nothing could ever change that. Clay slowly nodded. Annie's eyes never left mine. Day 786 to 792. It took us nearly a week to cross the border and make it to the outskirts of the fertile fields that surrounded Farmbridge. It seemed like they'd expanded, and we were surprised to be greeted by a patrol in a desert paint Humvee. A big upgrade from horses. The patrol knew who we were instantly, and it was a relief to dump our travel gear in the back of the Humvee and enjoy a cramped but quick ride to Farmbridge. I'd forgotten what a luxury motorized travel was. The patrol had a radio, and by the time we pulled up to the main gates, there was a small crowd waiting to greet us. There were some of Clay's people mixed in with them, but my eyes were on the five figures rushing out toward us. Lily practically threw herself into my arms at the same time as Lucky reached me, practically knocking me over. Then she took a step back and in her own awkward way giggled as she traced the pattern of the new scar on my cheek over her own. Cool scar. Lily then turned her attention to Annie, just as Robbie and Meg both reached me. The brother and sister duo hugged me simultaneously and also threatened to knock me over. Lucky happily jumped and ran laps around us, barking the entire time. Finally, Christina approached. She didn't throw herself into a hug the way others had. I could see it in her eyes. I'd turned her into a killer. That had worn on her. Plus, she left me once before the end of the world. Those issues must have still been unresolved. It was okay, though. We gave each other a quick hug and I moved past her. Alexis was there at the edge of the milling crowd. There were tears pooling in her eyes, and I could see the strain on her face from trying to hold them in. I pushed my way to her and hesitated for just a moment before throwing my arms around her. Day 793 to 795. Lucky hadn't left my side since I'd been back. 
Every time I stood up, he got up too, almost like he was afraid if he didn't stick right by me, I'd leave again. Ruslano was away on a diplomatic mission, but would be back soon. Until then, it was nice to just have the family together again. We laughed and joked together, and for two precious days, I completely forgot about the world. I was only reminded when I took my shirt off. Alexis gasped each time, looking at my bevy of fresh scars from my months in the arena. I didn't tell her details, and I didn't tell her about the fuego, but it was there. Deep in my brain, just like Vaccaro had said, I could feel the burn of it in the quietest parts of the night as I struggled to fall back asleep. Alexis with one arm over my chest and Lucky curled up on the other side. It was like both were trying to hem me in, keep me from disappearing again. Days 796 to 799. Annie's messenger had gotten word to Farmbridge about our predicament, and his testimony had convinced some of Clay's people that the Azteco threat was real. A group of them had come to Farmbridge to wait for his return, and were only days away from going south themselves in a rescue attempt if we hadn't shown up when we did. The community had grown considerably, and Farmbridge, along with half a dozen other smaller settlements, including Big Bear, had formed a coalition. They were calling it the California Republic, and news had spread north. Representatives from other communities were expected to arrive soon. The shattered remains of Southern California, blasted by nuclear war and apparently forgotten by the US government if it even existed anymore, were pulling themselves together to fight both the Azteco and Army of Dawn threat. But it was more than that, it was a set of shared values, a desire for re-civilization of humanity under the same liberal democratic values of the old world, a rejection of both Azteco anarchy and the Iron Lady's tyranny. It gave me hope, I guess. Farmbridge had power thanks to a rough power station they'd built, fueled by real gasoline. California still held a significant reserve of the stuff, and the Republic's engineers had pooled their talents and resources to resuscitate the petroleum industry. It was a small start. Gas was highly rationed, but it meant the Republic could generate electricity and fuel combat vehicles again. Lily showed me photos of Big Bear she'd taken on a battery-powered digital camera they found up there. It was of a small group of homes in a cul-de-sac. It was our place, she said, where we could all live together as neighbors. She pointed out her and Annie's home, Robbie and Meg's, and of course Alexis and I. It made me smile. It was a really nice fantasy. Day 800. You could see the dust from the large motorcade long before you heard it. A long line of vehicles, some I recognized as belonging to Clay's people, our people now I guess. They'd sent a large detachment after Clay had contacted them over the radio. Another perk of civilization's slow return to the wastes. At the rear of the formation was a U.S. Army striker, and as it came into view, my blood ran cold. It bore the emblem of the Army of Dawn in what seemed like pretty fresh paint. As the convoy rolled inside the gates, Ruslana stepped out of the lead vehicle and Clay hurried to greet his people. But my eyes were locked on that striker, and the familiar figure that ducked out of the rear ramp and carefully, slowly took in Farmbridge in its entirety. Then the Iron Lady's eyes locked on me. Now go see where it all started with I Survived 100 Days of Nuclear War, or click this other video instead.